I attempted a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee using only flying types. With only 153 Pokemon available plus Alolan forms, there's actually a ton to work with. Pidgeot, Butterfree, Fearow, Gyarados, Golbat, Charizard, Farfetch'd, Dodrio, Scyther, Aerodactyl, and Dragonite for a total of 11 encounters, sans the banned legendary birds. The diversity should give us a great advantage in terms of our secondary typings, but rock and electric types will still be quite the struggle to take out. But will they be enough? We'll have to see. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel as we're just 8,500 subscribers away from my 2023 goal of 200,000. Like this video and leave a comment below with what other monotype hardcore nuzlocks you'd like to see that haven't been completed yet. But with that, rules are in the description with one addition for Let's Go. No stat boosting candies, no species specific candies. We've seen a single oddish steamroll this game before, and I need a challenge. So let's jump right in. So with this run, I decided to use Let's Go Pikachu instead of Eevee, since Scyther is only available here as opposed to the non-flying type Pinsir. Seems pretty self-explanatory. So once we obtain our unusable Pikachu, it's off to Route 1 for our first encounter in Pidgey. Nothing too crazy here. Normal and flying at least gives us an immunity to ghost types once we hit Agatha in the Elite Four, but we have a few other ones that we're going to get in the future, so I'm not too attached. Same thing goes for Spiro, as Dodrio is the superior version of this Pokemon in terms of spamming Drill Peck and coverage with the likes of Jump Kick, but it will suffice for the beginning of the game. With two encounters, though, it's very easy to take out our first rival fight against Trace, using only Eevee as I lead with Spiro, firing off three pecks in the face of a tackle, growl, and another tackle, then doing around two-thirds before swapping into Pidgey and finishing it off with two gusts. Route two's next, and... Uh, oh, I uh, didn't expect to just get a full odds shiny randomly, but I will take it. If you're wondering, I do use shiny claws in my Nuzlocks, but I take a page out of Yawn from Pokemon Challenges book, and just replaced my non-shiny Pidgey from Route 1 with this. However, for my actual Route 2 encounter, I end up nabbing Caterpie. That's, of course, going to evolve into Butterfree at level 10, so I'm just going to hold it into the party to gain experience until it evolves. That's all three available encounters before Brock, though, so with a quick grind to level 12, I'm ready for him. This fight's going to need a little bit of cheese, though, starting out, as there's no way I'm going to be able to beat Brock down without losing to immediately Onyx's Rock Throw. But by leading off with Pidgey and using six sand attacks against Geodude, I'm able to get his accuracy down enough to get Spiro in there for six growls. This then gives me enough of a buffer to finally bring in Butterfree, set up six hardens for Onyx, all while taking as little damage as possible. Only taking three tackles in the process before firing off three gusts to KO Geodude, learning Sleep Powder and Poison Powder before Onyx comes in last. I leave with Poison Powder as a rock throw hits for some decent damage, even with my massively buffed defense, but matching that with its brittle special defense in the face of Gust, and I've got a victory at hand after being brought down to just slightly under half HP, winning the fight and the boulder badge. I wouldn't be shocked if I have to do this with Lieutenant Surge as well, but the rest of the fights I should be able to get away with using more beefy strategies compared to accuracy cheese. God, I'm hungry. Moving on to Route 3, there is technically an encounter here in Charmander, but really, there's no need to grab this until after Erica, since we won't be able to use it until we get Charizard, which is at level 36. So, instead I just move into Mount Moon to grab Zubat, as well as the Route 4 Pokemon Center to buy myself a Magikarp. No Gyarados until after Misty, but that will certainly be a powerhouse once we get it. After taking care of the super nerd that nearly beats me with a Magnemite, Jesse and James are ready for a fight and I'm ready to swap them down. Hitting a combined wing attack and gust combo on Ekans with Zubat and Butterfree respectively to KO before it gets the chance to attack, leaving just coughing to poison Butterfree, falling after two turns of the same barrage to blast them out of here. I do have a rival fight in Cerulean City, however, leading Zubat against Pidgey as it goes for wing attack to evade my potential flinching with bite, hitting two as I hit two bites before a potion comes down, but thanks to a wing attack and bite combo, I get away with only being hit twice as Eevee comes in second. Wing attack does big damage as Eevee does a bit with tackle, but seeing as this is barely going to be a three shot, I figured I'd go for absorb to get some extra HP before KOing with wing attack, but it actually does so little that I need two more attacks to finish it off again anyway. Seeing Tail Whip this turn though, I figure it'd be better if I swap out into Butterfree, taking another Tail Whip on swap before taking a tackle, hitting Gust, then doing the same thing next turn to KO, all while still remaining above half HP, leaving just Oddish to fall to two Psybeams after landing a Poison Powder to claim victory. 
Admittedly, having this many encounters in the early game certainly makes these fights easier, even if this is only one more Pokemon at this point compared to my last run with Grass types, which you should check out after this one if you haven't seen it already. With only 5 encounters, it's quite the rough adventure. But after getting the SS tickets, it's time for Misty. With the power of my newly evolved Pidgeotto and fully evolved Butterfree, this should be a breeze, but should is the key word here. She leads with Psyduck, myself with Butterfree hitting a Psybeam on turn 1 that immediately confuses with Psyduck hitting itself, so I'm able to KO with a second with no damage as Starmie enters second. Now with Scald, this thing is a house, so I need to put it to sleep to start doing some shenanigans pretty quickly. Now sadly, the first Sleep Powder misses, really hurting for the Compound Eyes ability, or any ability for that matter at this point, as Scald does a little bit less than half with no burn, allowing for the second one to pick up the Sleep, then give me a clean switch into Pidgeotto. Unfortunately though, Starmie is faster and manages to hit a Scald for less than half, but with the burn, I don't think I'm going to be able to stick around for an extra turn, so I get one more sand attack in to try to stave off the damage, but upon seeing how little the burn damage actually does, I find it safe to stay in and start going for Roost to fiend for either a Scald miss, or getting back to full HP with Roost since it's collectively doing less than half damage. With the latter happening as I get the second sand attack off, then going back to Roost after a miss, which Starmie starts going for Swift. Perfect. This is why I don't think Sand Attack Cheese matters too much here, since she does have a move to bypass this, but it's at least lower power than Scald and doesn't have the chance to burn. That and I don't have a way to lower special attack, so I think this is a necessary evil to stay alive. For Mirror, we just trade Swift and Wing Attack back and forth, with the former doing decent damage while Wing Attack barely does anything, seeing as we're burned. But considering Starmie still has a decent amount of power points for Scald, I figure getting that to continue missing is going to be important, even if it does land both a Psy Wave and Scald back to back, despite being at minus 4 and minus 5 accuracy respectively. But with those attacks taken, we eventually use up all of our roosts, getting Starmie to half HP, then use Wing Attack for as many turns as I get away with before getting into Scald KO range, swapping out for Zubat in order to shield myself with Confuse Ray following a Swift, getting a self-inflicted hit before nailing a super effective bite to take the win. That admittedly could have gone a lot worse, but considering my options, I don't think I had too much else to really do. But hey, a win's a win. But now with access to Gyarados before Lieutenant Surge, a wonderful time for it I must say. Just a great time to have a water and flying type before the electric gym leader, uh, we've got to head south to Cerulean City and into Vermilion, which unfortunately doesn't have any new encounters around the city. We're still rocking five party members, though at least we do get a Persian to ride around on after capturing five Growlithes. I mean, it's cool, but of course it has to remain in our party for me to actually use it for riding around, so this is going to be short-lived. Aboard the SSN is our next rival fight, and with our newly evolved Fero, Golbat, and Gyarados, we're definitely in the clear for no need of accuracy deprivations here. He leads off with Pidgeotto as I go with Gyarados, going for Bite for half damage as Wing Attack barely does anything, hitting a second to KO as Eevee comes in, leading to the same outcome of two bites for the KO, Last out is Hottish, and despite having a rare neutrality with a Grass-type move against my team with Razor Leaf, uh, two bites just does him in once again, winning me the fight, the chop down secret technique, and entrance into Surge's gym. However, since we hate Alola, I'm fighting Mina again. Uh, thankfully, we have Golbat for this, though admittedly, Mr. Mime is still a problem, so I'm probably going to use something else. That being Butterfree against Jigglypuff as her lead, only to show off that I have a new, wonderful attack in Quiver Dance. I can only use one of these before getting hit with Disable, but that's plenty enough for me to start going for Psybeam. Two-shotting and only getting hit with a Light Pound before Mr. Mime comes out, sets up Light Screen, but Sleep Powder puts it to sleep after hitting Gust. So I'm able to start using a few more Quiver Dances after that now that it's not disabled anymore, letting me KO with a few Gusts to single-handedly rip through this nightmare of an Alola Trainer, because we hate Gen 7! Now before Surge, I figured I'd run out to Route 9 and clear out their trainers, considering we can and need the levels, though I'm still kinda sad that there's no new encounters. If I could make it through Rock Tunnel at this point, I theoretically could gain access to places like Lavender Town, Celadon City, and others where I could get the TMs for Roost and Waterfall, very important for my team here, though we'll just have to wait until after Surge to do so. At least for now, I have a strategy that should at least do enough to keep me alive with just enough luck. 
Surge leads Voltorb as I go with Pidgeotto, and you know what time it is, baby. It's sand attack time, seeing light screen from Voltorb turn one, then going for it again as he misses Thunderbolt, letting me hit a second, then seeing him use Swift. Gahaha, <laughs> ha, it's the star me all over again. We've already bypassed the potential of Thunderbolt for now, allowing me to continue laying in with Sand Attack and Roost to keep my HP up, though seeing a Thunderbolt hit after I hit my sixth Sand Attack, eh, it's kinda got me scared. So I swap out into Pidgeotto, going for Golbat to hit Confuse Ray, then finally bringing in Butterfree so I can start setting up Quiver Dance. If I can get to six, I should be able to just sweep the team, and sure enough, after seeing Light Screen after just one Quiver Dance is set up, that gives me five turns to set up the last five, letting it elapse and blast Voltorb, Magnemite, and Raichu all with one side beam apiece to KO and win the fight. That could have gone a lot worse if Voltorb decided to prioritize Thunderbolt over Light Screen, though I'm not sure if the AI would actually do that. They do love prioritizing their screens in Let's Go, whether it's Voltorb's Light Screen, Sabrina and her Mr. Mime's dual screens, and a few others I'm probably neglecting to mention at the moment. But with our third badge in hand, I can head back through Diglett's Cave to grab the Old Amber from Pewter City, then get light up for heading through Rock Tunnel. Now you might think this place is horrendous to get through, uh, but then I remembered that I had the TM for Scald? Uh, yeah, Gyarados can learn this, and despite having pretty low special attack in comparison to the physical side, it's more than enough to blast through the specially frail rocks in here, letting me emerge into Lavender Town unscathed, finally moving over into Celadon City and getting my hands on that sweet, Sweet Waterfall TM that I have been waiting for for a bit now, as well as Reflect, Light Screen, back over in Lavender Town South with Roost, the works that I should be able to make it do the rest of the run without the need of Sand Attack. Though, I will keep it on Pidgeotto in case of a drastic emergency. Even getting the likes of U-Turn for Golbat and Furo, as well as Psychic from Saffron City for Butterfree to replace Psybeam, is quite the upgrade, especially when I also grabbed Shadow Ball from Celadon, which I can swap between that and Psychic on Butterfree, so that's going to be pretty convenient. Especially when you match it with the newly learned Stabbed Air Slash that replaced Gust, but I digress. Before I can take on Erica here shortly though, I gotta clear out Pokemon Tower, including a rival fight. He leads Bad Pidgeotto, I lead Good Pidgeotto, and... I think I'm taking liberties here. I don't think I was thinking at the time about the integrity of the video, so I kinda just sand attacked him six times, swapped a Firo, Prowled him six times, then finally swapped into Butterfree to Quiver Dance six times and swept with Psychic to Pidgeotto, Jolteon, and Gloom to win the fight, all while learning Bug Buzz over Sleep Powder since another stab attack that's boosted by Quiver Dance is more than welcome. But I promise that's not going to be every fight. Don't leave, please. Only the ones where I don't have very consistent options. One evasive sweep through Pokemon Tower's trainers later, though, and we're finally good to head on over to Celadon again to take down Erika. She's leading Tangela, I'm leading Golbat, and this is the perfect counter here. Sure, I can get put to sleep with Sleep Powder, but the quad resistance to Grass, along with the super effective Wing Attack and Leech Life to regain HP, is perfect to keep Golbat at full HP upon KOing Tangela, then KOing Vileplume with two Wing Attacks following a resisted Moon Blast, and doing a Wing Attack Leech Life combo with Weep and Bell following a weak Poison Jab, winning me the fight. Now we're cruising, though admittedly I would like some new team members shortly, though I could have grabbed Doduo before this, I'm not sure why I didn't. By the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, do take a quick moment and click the like button and check if you're subscribed. People forget this all the time, like a lot, and it would help immensely in reaching my goal of hitting 200,000 subscribers by the end of 2023. We're only 8,100 subscribers away, and while we only have a little over a month, I think it's possible, so I would really appreciate your help. Next up, Rocket Hideout time. Nothing too crazy in here as the trainers cause no issues, and Jesse and James are outed pretty easily by a combo of Gyarados and Butterfree, using Waterfall to try and flinch Arbok so that no glare shenanigans can take place, though that does fail and Gyarados gets glared, though with Psychic KOing before Weezing gets the chance to move, it's a hop, skip, and jump to the win as Weezing is destroyed by two Psychics from Butterfree after two Sludges, all while Gyarados is held down by Paralysis. Archer's second in the lineup here, leading with Weezing as I go with Gyarados, going for Waterfall for over half as Sludge Bomb does a quarter, KOing and leading to Golbat who has Crunch, but even two of those it's only enough to bring Gyarados to slightly below half HP, as two Waterfalls finishes the fight, leaving just Giovanni. Of course, two Pokemon is no match for Gyarados once again, as Persian leads against Gyarados, hitting Fake Out and Slash for less than half before Waterfall hits for over half, 
KOing following a second non-crit slash as Rhyhorn comes out second and dies immediately to Waterfall to net me the win. Clearing out the hideout, but not of Rocket Fight since it's back to the Pokemon Tower for yet another battle against Jesse and James. Though with the noon fully evolved Pidgeot and Charizard, now as Charmander was available also in Rock Tunnel, we should be good. I should also note, Charmander learns Flamethrower at level 35, and since we don't get access to that TM until Cinnabar Island, I'm able to keep it unevolved until then, get it to 35, learn the move, evolve into Charmeleon, then lastly evolve it into Charizard one level later, and gives me a wonderful attacking move that should come in handy. I lead with Gyarados and Charizard against Weezing and Arbok, outspeeding Arbok and pub stomping it with both Waterfall and Flamethrower before it has the chance to move, doing the same to Weezing next turn, following a light attack to Gyarados for only about a quarter damage before winning the fight. Good stuff! Now I can finally focus about getting some new encounters, like Doduo from Route 16, getting the TM for Dazzling Gleam while I'm on Route 12 but also capturing Farfetch'd, making Fuchsia City flyable as well as getting both secret techniques from there before finally bringing the team up to level 41 in preparation for Silphco's blue fight as well as the other rocket stuff. Considering Blue's Executor is destroyed by Charizard's Flamethrower at the beginning here, only using two of them to KO through a light screen, it's a pretty easy curb stomp of his own Charizard as well. I do waste a little bit of time with my own Charizard trying to like roost it out of the game and hit a bunch of smoke screens, but all I really need to do is swap out into Gyarados and hit it with Waterfall. I, I don't know why I was trying to cheese, I was just simply delaying the inevitable here. Now I did have a scare against Archer in the Grunt double battle where Firo was going to die to Thunderbolt, though thanks to the power of friendship I was saved at 1 HP, allowing for Roost to be set up. I was trying to let Cubone KO the Electrode with Bone Meringue since it was super effective while outlasting the super effective Thunderbolts on my team, following hitting a powerful flamethrower with my lead Charizard, though the literal child kept going for muck like an empty-headed fucking dumb fuck instead of being able to notice what the actual threat was on the team. I'm tired, I'm hurt, I work with children. This Cubone and his trainer wouldn't even be able to manage a Pokemart. I kept just cycling through my team though, finally bringing in Pidgeot on the self-destruct turn, which did next to nothing to Pidgeot. Uh, that's kind of wild, I didn't expect it to do so little, but it was enough for it to go down, bring Raticate down to just a little HP, allow for the literal child to take it out with Bone Meringue, leaving just Archer's Pokemon in a two-on-one scenario, which I'm sure you could tell went pretty effectively from this point forward since our duo of good and bad Pidgeots KO'd both Weezing and Golbat in quick succession, winning me the fight. Jesse and James are also quick KOs though, as straight after the Gyarados and Charizard combo coming in clutch once again with Flamethrower and Waterfall, just utterly tearing through Arbok and Weezing in one turn after the other, even Thunderbolt from Weezing wasn't enough to do even half damage to Gyarados, letting me clean them out of the area and leave just Giovanni's three Pokemon. Once again leading Persian as I go for Charizard, and thanks to a burn on my first flamethrower following the fake out, I was able to get a roost in and nearly fully heal thanks to a non-crit slash, finishing it off with the second flamethrower as Rhyhorn enters second. Of course, swapping out a Charizard into Gyarados only to take Rock Throw for less than half, KOing with Scald next turn as Nidoqueen enters last, and goes down to Waterfall straight away to net me the win. Easy enough, though I guess I didn't need Charizard for Nidoqueen after all, but always good to set up backup plays in case something goes wrong. But with that, we're clear for the quadruple header now of Kogo, Sabrina, Blaine in the last Giovanni fight, so we may as well go take them down now. With Koga though, I decided to finally start swapping the team around, taking out Firo for Dodrio so that I'd have the faster, harder hitting normal and flying type with Drill Pack, and that should help immensely for Venomoth as well as maybe anything else. First up, Weezing against Dodrio, and of course I'm kicking off with Sword Stance against Protect. I know I can get away with this even through an explosion, but upon seeing a Toxic on turn 2, I know I can get to plus 6, then just go from there as on turn 3 it's Protect, hitting Drill Peck on turn 4 to Weezing to KO, doing the same thing to Muck following a Protect, but that Toxic has gone too far because of all the Protect shenanigans, leaving Dodrio with only 13 HP. I'm gonna swap here, and Charizard is the pick since Golbat has Fly, I have Protect, and that's a free swap if I've ever seen one. So after seeing a Protect from Golbat, I opt to then swap into Gyarados only to Protect against the Fly, but then we're finally able to connect with Waterfall upon seeing Toxic, expelling it at the end of the turn with the power of Friendship, and doing the same after the same routine happens again, leaving Gyarados against Venomoth last. Of course though, Venomoth uses Protect and then Sludge Bomb to get the third poisoning of the bout, with this one remaining as Waterfall doesn't nearly KO, but by swapping out into Golbat on a Sludge Bomb, I can outspeed and KO with Wing Attack, defeating Koga and handing me the Soul Badge. 
Straight after, with Sabrina, I decided once again to reorganize the team, removing Golbat in place of my newly revived Aerodactyl now that we can use this game's version of Surf outside of battle. So that hard-hitting, fast rock typing that's physical should certainly give me an edge. If I need a backup plan, that is. That's right, Bug Type Butterfree coming in hot to set up Quiver Dance on the first two turns as Mr. Mime goes for dual screens, letting me get off a third as Psychic does pitiful damage, letting me set up a fourth, fifth, and sixth, all through Psychics that barely do anything, allowing for the light screen to wear off and destroying Mr. Mime, Jinx, Slowbro, and Alakazam all with one Bug Buzz each to win the fight in short order. And of course, after picking everything up needed out of the Pokemon Mansion, it's time for Blaine. He leads Magmar, myself with Gyarados, and despite being hit with Confuse Ray, Waterfall goes through for the one-shot as Arcanine enters second. It outspeeds and hits Outrage, but once again we don't hit ourselves in Confusion, one-shotting with Waterfall. From here I decided to go for Protect with Rapidash in case I can get away with another turn of not being hit in Confusion, or to snap out of it without getting hit, and sure enough we do snap out on the turn as we Protect against Flare Blitz, being hit with it next turn for around 50 HP as Waterfall once again gets the one shot, leaving just nine tails to outspeed, hit Fire Blast for minimal damage, and leaves Gyarados at a quarter of its HP to KO with a fourth and final Waterfall to win the fight. Sweet, one more gym battle to go. I've once again reshuffled the team here, bringing back Golbat over Butterfree, which technically I did in Blaine's gym, but it applies here as well considering we're just going against some rock types, though my whole team's weak to it, so may as well bring in as few quad weaknesses as possible, barring Charizard since it takes care of Dugtrio easily, though I don't think I need it. Waterfall is just the name of the game here with Gyarados, taking a slash from Dugtrio, waterfalling it, waterfalling the Rhydon, waterfalling the Nidoqueen, and last but certainly not least, waterfalling the Nidoking to win the fight, all while taking only a single attack. There's a reason people say Gyarados is one of the most busted Pokemon for Nuzlocke, especially when the physical special split is in effect. And I've gotta say, it's still quite funny just how fast the final four gym leaders are steamrolled in Kanto in comparison to the first four. Alright, one rival battle, one victory road trek, and we'll be ready for the Elite Four. After bringing the team to level 52, we're ready leading Aerodactyl against Trace's Pidgeot to outspeed and pummel it with Rock Slide. Nearly KOing, but not quite, as Air Slash does minimal damage, KOing next turn as Jolteon enters second. Now I figure I can get a free Rock Slide out here and not die to Thunderbolt, so I do so, but I get the flinch, so uh, yeah, sure, I'll take it, free KO with a second one. Out comes Vileplume third, so I go for Fly, but of course, because Pokemon decided to make this a thing, Toxic hits while I'm in the air in a semi-invulnerable state, not even on screen, poisoning literally nothing as Fly connects next turn, only to take a Petal Dance that brings in combination with the Poison, Aerodactyl to red HP. So, since Vileplume's locked in a Petal Dance, I bring in Charizard and go for Flamethrower, KOing and leaving just Marowak. Of course, being a ground type, that thing is not really going to be able to hit Charizard with a damn, though admittedly a critical thrash almost does half damage, so kudos to the now evolved child for being able to do something. It wasn't anything substantial, but it at least did something. But with that, one victory road trek later, and we've arrived at the Pokemon League. Now before we can go in, there's still two encounters I'd like to grab beforehand. Firstly, on Route 15, there's a 1% spawn of Scyther. You know how long it took for Scyther to appear? 45 minutes. That sucked. Well, at least I was able to grab it, and along over on Route 10, Dragonair. Yeah, I didn't expect to get that over Tratini, but at least it popped up within only three minutes, letting me grind everybody up to level 55, getting Dragonite, as well as five heart scales from Cerulean City, now that we have access to the move relearner, and deciding on my final team of Charizard, Aerodactyl, Gyarados, Scyther, Dodrio, and Dragonite. This team is stacked. Though, hilariously, I did prepare Butterfree, Farfetch'd, Fero, Pidgeot, and Golbat in the box, since for some ungodly reason, you can access your box from inside of the Elite Four chambers, so in case something goes drastically wrong, I can at least bring in some worse party members, though I'd like to not have to do that. Also, in case anybody was wondering, I'm not allowing Mega Evolution against Trace. I used to allow for Mega Evolutions against bosses that used it themselves, but I don't think Charizard necessarily needs any buffs, especially when the X variant literally makes it not a flying type and therefore not eligible for this challenge, doesn't have Drought to buff Flamethrower, it's literally useless. But with that, I enter the chamber ready for battle. Firstly, Lorelei leads with Dugong, I lead with Scyther, and thanks to a combo of Roost, Sword Stance, and Agility, I can basically destroy anything in one hit, outspeed anything outside of a priority attack, in this case Dugong's Ice Shard, and hit it with any move of choice, whether it be Headbutt, Brick Break, or X-Scissor by TM. 
Really unfortunate that Scyther doesn't get fly, but wing attack is so weak and likely that it would just be nearly impossible to set up on Bruno that there's no need for it. However, we are able to just sit here, take Ice Shards from Dugong, use Roost to get to full HP, and start blasting out X Scissors upon getting to plus 6 attack and plus 2 speed. KOing Dugong, Jinx, Lapras, barely missing the KO on Cloyster as we survive on Ice Beam on a quarter HP, KOing with the second, then finally Slowbro just with X Scissor to win the fight. It feels so good using Scyther again, by the way. Though, I don't think I'll be soloing this Elite Four like I did when I had access to it in my Crystal with Flying Types run. Check it out, by the way, it's on the iCard on your screen. The game is a little more difficult than that, though. So, Bruno has Onyx. I mean, that kind of seals that away. But oddly enough, this Onyx only has Iron Tail and Earthquake. So instead, I'm going to be leading Jodrio here as we also have access to Sword Stance and Agility. So I'm able to set up two Sword Stances, one Agility, and take a couple of Iron Tails before being able to one-shot the Onyx with Jump Kick, then Drill Peck to one-shot Hitmonlee, Hitmonchan, Machamp, and Polyrath to win the fight. By the way, why didn't Bruno have one of these in the original Red, Blue, and Yellow? It's literally right there as one of the most unique fighting types of the game. Following this is Agatha, and of course, since Aerodactyl gets Earthquake, this makes for a great option here. Earthquake nearly one-shots Arbok as it uses Glare, which is unfortunate as we're held down for a turn, repeatedly getting hit with Crunch, but since I have access to Roost, this should make for an effective stall tactic. Though, we do hit Earthquake after the first Roost, taking a defense drop from Crunch right before KOing, so I'm not too keen on keeping it in uh, for the rest of the fight because it's just incapacitated. Defense drop, paralyzed, I uh, just gotta do something else. Thankfully, my backup plan is also Earthquake, but this time on Dragonite. I swap in him on a Weezing Thunderbolt, and then remember, I forgot to give Earthquake to Dragonite. Goody. I guess we're not doing this. I hit a Fire and Thunder Punch combo, but of course, we have Earthquake on Gyarados, so round three, ladies and gentlemen. I bring it into KO following a Sludge Bomb, doing the same to Gengar after dodging with the Power of Friendship, taking a Sludge Bomb from the second Gengar and KOing just the same, leaving just Golbat to hit a Crunch for half of my remaining HP before Waterfall nearly KOs, but of course, it's not enough. I'm forced to swap into Charizard, take a Crunch, then fire back with a Flamethrower to clean up the KO and the win. See, I told you we wouldn't be using Scyther for this whole thing. I literally used all of my members of the team by the third league opponent. But it's back to Scyther for Lance as he leads Seedra. I lead Scyther, of course. And we're just doing the same thing again. Using Sword Stance, roosting to outheal Hydro Pump since it does less than half, fiending for a miss, getting it on the fourth and using our second Sword Stance, then getting yet another dodge as the fifth and final Hydro Pump misses, letting me set up my first agility in the face of a Dragon Pulse doing less than a quarter. The second agility is able to be used here as we dodge Dragon Pulse once again due to the power of friendship, and I really wish there was a way to disable this mechanic. Modders, if anyone has the knowledge of the inner workings of Let's Go and can remove this feature, let me know. I'd love to use it on future Nuzlocks instead of getting away with nonsense. I finally go for my third Sword Stance as Hyper Beam connects from Seedra, forcing a recharge turn as I go for Roost to get that HP back, using my final agility as I expect another Hyper Beam, but instead it's Dragon Pulse, healing that off and managing to dodge yet another attack due to the power of friendship, leaving me at full HP. Well then, perfect opportunity to start whacking these Pokemon into dust, but of course I misclick and go for a fourth Sword Stance as Seedra connects with another Dragon Pulse. Well, I guess back to Roost until we either get a dodge or a Hyper Beam recharge turn. I did give Scyther three Power Point Ups in preparation for this to make sure I got to 16 uses of it, and we're able to get a dodge back into full HP, hitting Headbutt to... Uh, not KO, but we do get the flinch and... Uh, oh, he's swapping. Into Aerodactyl? That's literally the most threatening Pokemon on the whole team, but by swapping and letting me hit it for half damage for free, I'm effectively able to take it out without nearly dying to a Rock Slide and risking a critical hit, KOing with the second and laying into Seedra for the KO following up after the useless swap, leading to Gyarados. No Intimidate means no drops here, hitting Headbutt to flinch and again to KO, leading to Charizard. Once again, Headbutt doesn't get the one shot. Come on, dude, I got plus six. That should be enough. As Air Slash connects for less than half, letting me KO with a second Headbutt and leave just Dragonite. I figured I'd just burn through the rest of my Roosts here to test for Outrage, but sure enough, holy moly, was that a lot of damage. Really glad I used Roost there, surviving and leaving me to swap into Gyarados next turn. Outrage once again lands for over half, so I have to swap again, this time into Charizard as the third and final Outrage finally leaves him in a state of confusion, swapping one more time into Aerodactyl and thankfully getting the stealth hit, giving me the space needed to hit Rock Side for about 75%. Well with that, Crunch should be able to get the KO from this range and dodge the potential missing of Rock Slide and Fly, and sure enough, we missed the goddamn range. Shocking. Chaotic Meatball doesn't miss a range challenge. Impossible. 
Thankfully, the game does the right thing and says, nah, f that, that was dumb, and gives me a friendship survival with Aerodactyl, allowing me to KO with Crunch next turn with the win intact through this rather scuffed battle. That was not good. Maybe I should have sat on Charizard for a bit and roosted with Scyther until it either missed Air Slash or I ran out of roosts. But I suppose we made it through with all of our Pokemon. No need to panic. We could do this Deathless if for a few mistakes that the game graciously allowed. Now then, the last battle against Trace begins as I go with Aerodactyl once again against his lead Pidgeot. Mega evolving immediately as I go for Rock Slide, doing over half and not flinching as Air Slash hits for a quarter, KOing next turn with a second. See, this is why I didn't use Mega Evolutions. Despite three of my encounters being capable of it, I'm surprised actually. Second out is Jolteon being nailed by an Earthquake to nearly KO, but of course it hits the 70% accurate Thunder, finally putting an end to my Deathless Dream. That's fine though, we are going out to Dodrio to try Jump Kick here, doing less than half but only just barely after a full restore. Uh, well, I should have gone for Dragonite, I guess. A second jump kick connects to miss the range once again to KO, but thankfully the game graciously gave me a thunder miss, doing the same next turn as Strillpeck KOs. Two down, four to go as Rapidash enters, so I opt to swap into Gyarados, taking Flare Blitz for a quarter, but unfortunately being burned. Well, shoot, I guess Waterfall might not KO here, and thanks to the recoil we do, it does bring her into the red, but with the burn damage, I don't want to risk it, instead opting to swap into Charizard on the second full restore. I eh, should have seen that one coming, could have hit another waterfall, but at least we have Air Slash to potentially flinch him out of the game, getting a crit for over half as well as the flinch as the second gets the KO, keeping Charizard at full HP as Slowbro enters fourth. Alright, well, out to Dragonite we go since there's no ice moves on this as coverage, seeing a light screen on the swap in. Perfect. That's room for Thunder Punch to hit for over a third as Psychic is dodged by Friendship, with Earthquake picking up the damage needed to keep Slowbro both out of full restore range, but in range for the second Thunder Punch to pick up the KO, following a Psychic hitting. Fifth out is Vileplume, and of course, Ice Punch is in order here, doing well over half as Reflect is set up. Well, shoot, I guess this is what Roost is for. Just do this five times to outlast the Reflect, though I can't quite say at full HP thanks to Sludge Bomb getting the poisoning on the first turn, leading to a bit of chip damage every turn. That's fine though, we're still out of crit range, and as long as we stay out of that, we're safe. The third turn, we do expel the poison out of Friendship, can we stop triggering that please? And the fourth and final Sludge Bomb connects as time elapses on Reflect, allowing me to KO it with a second Ice Punch, and leaving just Marowak to fall to two Ice Punches, following a weak Brick Break, winning me the match, and the Nuzlocke with only a single death. Not bad whatsoever, and a great retribution to the grass type run that we did last week. We won, we had plenty of encounters, no more to be really worried about at that point. However, there are a few more types I want to try out before the end of the year. Poison, water, steel, fire maybe, psychic. Oddly enough, actually, steel has four encounters because you get the two Alolan, Sandslash, and Doug Trio, as well as Meltan and Melmetal. Uh, the works, basically. You'll be seeing them in due time. As for next time, I think we're going to return to the well of bootleg jank as we take on the forbidden NES port of Pokemon Platinum. Until then, remember to like, subscribe, and comment down below what other videos you'd like to see me tackle in the future. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.